tractor, the pickup truck, the Jeep. Vehicles we call on when it comes time to do a job. But boy, how they love to play. These mainstays of the military and the farm have dusted off their work duds to become stars in the world of motorsports. So strap up for a ride on the wild side. It's time to shake, battle, and roll. Our romance with the automobile is more of a tale of beauty and the beast when it comes to monster trucks. These beautiful machines were first conceived with one purpose in mind, destruction, to flatten some of Detroit's best iron into worthless pulp. Monster truck competition has evolved from its early car-crushing exhibition days to its most exciting form, side-by-side -side competition. The action takes place on a variety of indoor and outdoor tracks, all dotted with junk cars and mounds of dirt that send these behemoths airborne. Like everything else in racing, monster truck technology continues to evolve, but there are some basic guidelines that keep a monster truck a monster. First, these trucks must race on monster tires that stand 66 inches high and 43 inches wide. Inflated at six to 10 pounds of pressure per square inch, they weigh 1,000 pounds apiece. Most of these 24 tear treads come off fertilizer spreaders in the Midwest and cost anywhere from $2,500 to $5,000 new or used. Racing engines, some blown and injected, some running alcohol, generate well over 1,000 horsepower in most of these trucks. But there is a maximum engine size of 500 cubic inches. One man's romance with a 1950 Chevy panel wagon has turned into a nightmare for fellow monster truck racers. But Dennis Anderson's Gravedigger is a fan's delight. Watching the Gravedigger run may not exactly be poetry in motion. Now it's more like a great artwork topping out at over 100 miles an hour. Look at that paint job. A masterpiece that would look right at home in most art galleries instead of a garage in Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina. The tombstones are for all the trucks the digger has laid to rest. And those red headlights let you know that the grave digger is putting it to the wood. No one on the monster truck circuit goes all out more of the time and drives his equipment harder than Dennis Anderson. And sometimes that no holds barred approach has the other drivers seeing red. This is 1990 Renegade Monster Truck Racing, isn't it? That's right. If, if you can't beat them, you got to kill them, I guess. That same reckless abandon can be found in something a few feet shallower than a grave, a mud pit. As a kid, what could be more fun than playing in the mud? Well, some grown-ups who still enjoy running through the mud compete in a sport that combines speed and slime. It's really drag racing at its dirtiest. The object is to make the quickest time through a mud pit that stands 200 feet from start to finish. The bog is 30 feet wide and three feet deep in its muckiest part. In the super modified class, most of the vehicles resemble factory-made Jeeps and trucks. But it's a wide open ball game for anything you want to do under the hood. And there's no limit on tire size. 
but they must be DOT approved. Fans like this class because the vehicles look just like the ones you'd see on the street. Their times are measured by a laser timing device. And after the finish line, you'll find 600 feet of shutdown space. And these guys will use every bit of it. One of the wildest rides in a monster truck circuit is Awesome Kong. Now, in monster truck racing, everybody's got their own idea of building the perfect truck. And in Texas, bigger usually means better. But smack dab in the heart of the Lone Star State, the folks who created Awesome Kong figured less was the way to go. The most famous pickup truck in the state of Texas is a stripped-down Chevrolet with a body that sets only 44 inches wide. Now, that's the width of a monster truck tire. This bare-bones racing machine has just enough room for the driver and the roll cage. The engine is mounted in the truck bed, and that's one thing Jeff Dane, Awesome Kong's creator, didn't lighten up on. Renowned engine builder Jerry Janke created the motor that powers Awesome Kong, a Chevy big block 496 cracking out around 1,000 horsepower. With less sheet metal than most, Awesome Kong is a driver's dream as far as seeing the track and his opponent during a race. And maybe that's just one reason why this Chevy has such a good view of the finish line most of the time. wild vehicles? No sport offers a greater variety than tractor pulling. Tractor pulling is often referred to as the most powerful sport on earth. Massive racing engines generate thousands of horsepower. But the sport of pulling is not about speed, it's power. All those horses are harnessed to build raw power to get an object weighing thousands of pounds down a track. We're talking the ultimate in heavy machinery here. There are several classes in pulling, the 7,200-pound multiple-engine tractors, the 5,800-pound class, which is a smaller version of the 7,200, modified four-wheel drive trucks, which resemble trucks you and I see on the streets, and perhaps the most competitive class in the sport, the two-wheel drive. No class in all of pulling has more diversity than the two-wheel drives. It's the funny car class of tractor pulling, You've got Chevy El Caminos, Ford Thunderbird, pickup trucks, a Model T, and even a 1908 Chevy panel van. Most of the engines you'll find in the class are supercharged, alcohol-burning, big-block V8. There are no cubic inch limitations. There is, however, a 6,200-pound weight limit that's for the driver in the cockpit. The most important thing in the two-wheel drive class is the proper weight distribution. The rear wheels do the pulling. But getting the weight right on the front end is one of the most critical aspects of the class. If there's not enough weight there, the front end will do a wheel stand. And the more the front end is up in the air, the less momentum to the rear wheels. Ideally, you want enough weight at the front of the vehicle to keep the nose about 12 inches off the ground. You also need the right amount of weight in the back for the best traction possible. Getting a two-wheel drive off the starting line is like driving a car out of a snowbank. You need a nice touch on the throttle coming out of the hole. That's why all the pullers use hand throttle, like on a farm tractor. 
As far as steering goes, well, the front wheels are up in the air, so it's mostly handled by the brakes. The dirt and the track vary from event to event. And on tracks that are looser, you might want to use a slower gear and have more weight in the back for the tires to hook up. On a harder track, the exact opposite would apply. Pulling appears to be a very technical and complex undertaking, but the object of the sport is simple. It's basically to see who can pull the sled the greatest distance. And here now is a look at some of those who do it best in the two-wheel drive class. Veteran drag racer and engine builder Jim Lyons out of Louisville, Kentucky in his 89 GMC stitches also. From Bettendorf, Iowa, the 1989 national champion Sundance Kid. This 88 Chevy S10 is a member of the Hunco racing team and driven by Rick Carpenter and his brother Ray. The 1989 runner-up, a farmer and owner of a trucking business, Ken Lamont out of Crossville, Illinois, in his 88 Chevy El Camino Midnight Express. The professor, Wayne Roush, out of Dublin, Ohio, in his yellow Model T. national champion out of Warrington, Georgia, Mike Stowe in his 89 Ford pickup, Bad Dog. Another Ford pickup driven by a farmer out of Linden Station, Wisconsin, Dan Walsh and the Irish Challenger. engine and chassis builder Bill Humphrey in his 89 Chevy Spike. Another member of the Humco racing team, Mark Hare in the Chevy S10, Jack Daniels. Veteran John Heilman out of Rockford, Ohio in his 88 Thunderbird, the Levi Garrett Golden Thunder. And another veteran, Jim Brockman, who like Heilman also competes in the multiple engine class. Brockman's 1908 Chevy panel van makes its home in New Haven, Indiana, and goes by the name of In-Laws and Outlaws. When monster trucks were first conceived, they didn't have to be light or fast when their only purpose was to crush cars. But all that changed once these trucks started racing. Most of today's monster trucks have lightened up. They now weigh between 10 and 12,000 pounds. And the power they now possess creates some serious hang time. But landing is where most races are won and lost. An indoor monster truck race is run in under five seconds. 
So you can see, there is no room for error. Tremendous tire speed landing on a crumpled body of a Chrysler does not exactly make for smooth sailing. So today's monster truck must combine suspension and horsepower in order to be competitive. One truck blending speed and agility better than most is the Equalizer from the volunteer state of Tennessee. Truck owner Gary Cook likes to think of the Equalizer as more of a giant stock car than a monster truck. This 1985 Chevy S10 can not only hammer out about 1,250 horsepower, but is also equipped with racing suspension. Double coil overshocks that measure some 55 inches with adjustable four-link suspension can absorb almost two feet of travel. Minimizing the balance and maximizing speed are two reasons why the Equalizer captured the 1989 Monster Truck World Championship. And this package of raw horsepower and racing suspension is one reason why the Equalizer has the advantage over most of the monster trucks. Muscle machines in mud racing compete in the open classes. This is the top of the line division where almost anything goes. In the early days of mud racing, the motto was run what you run, with stock trucks and jeeps mostly competing in the sport. Now mud racers come in all shapes and sizes. And more often than not, you have to use your imagination to figure out what kind of vehicle it's supposed to be. Most of these cars are more of a reflection of the racer's personality than anything else. That's especially true in two-wheel drive open class where all bodies and frames are custom built. These lightweight, nitrous-burning cars run small block engines generating around 1,000 horsepower. Rocket sleds and wheels of action are the order of the day in this class. In the unlimited classes, no cubic inch or horsepower limitations provide for a power-packed free-for-all. Big block, nitrous-burning racing engines shoot these cars across the mud pit in just three ticks of the clock. That translates to accelerating to 90 miles an hour from a dead stop in just three seconds. And again, that's in deep mud, not asphalt. But what truly makes a mud machine fit for the pits is the back rubber, paddle tires, bigger diggers, super scoopers, Groundhog. These tires are actually racing slicks with wide rubber cups vulcanized on them to help grab the mud. In the cut tire class, a perfectly good 38 to 44 inch DOT tire is shaved to the core, forming deep treads. These creative designs usually cost around $800 a pair. With the lockjaw bite and tremendous speed these tires get in the mud, beadlock clamps are used to keep the tire on the wheel. Most mud racing bodies are made out of fiberglass. 
a majority of the chassis are home built. But these machines don't come cheap by any means. With racing engines ranging from $28 to $30,000, most of the machines blasting through the pit can cost anywhere from $45 to $50,000. Most mud racers will tell you driving one of these machines is like being shot out of a cannon, and it takes daredevil driving skills to keep these machines in bounds. Mud bogging rides that same fine line between pushing it to the limit and disaster that is found in most racing. But the muddy rooster tails give this brand of speed a unique calling card. Some of the top racers in this sport include Enos Thomas from Grovetown, Georgia. Enos was the 1989 national champion. He and his son Mike, another former national champ, race a team of Chevys, the Mad Max, a rail with a 615 cubic inch nitrous burning motor, and a powerful fleet of Corvettes, the Heartbeat of America 1, and Heartbeat 2, and Murphy's Law. The New Breed, a unique design with a frame made from a quarter section of a coal truck and a 1927 Mercedes-Benz grill on the front of the hood. An all-aluminum 588 cubic inch nitrous burning engine built by Jerry Janke has helped pilot George Gregory out of Tyler, Texas take a couple of indoor titles with this car. The Mud Muscle, built and driven by Buster Smith out of Marietta, Georgia, is one of the few mud racers who gets his horsepower without running nitrous. This 1927 Peyton Roadster sports a 550 cubic inch Chevy engine with Pontiac heads and a two-speed Lenko transmission with a slipper clutch for better takeoff. Lynn Siebel and the Legal Speed, a Chevy S10 Blazer with a 568 cubic inch Chevrolet engine blown and injected on alcohol. Joe Kenzer's Bad Agent, 
one of the wildest runners on the circuit. This black Corvette funny car was built from the ground up by JoJo. Panama City, of course, is a mud racing hotbed, and some of the Panhandle's finest are represented by James Head's Rattler Racing Team. The Rattler 1, a 1970 Corvette. The Rattler 2, with a big block Chevy under that Jeep body. And the Showdown, a Jeep with a 605 cubic inch mountain motor able to crank out 1,900 horsepower with nitrous. Great sporting events take place on great playing surfaces, and in mud racing, it's no exception. The field of battle here, of course, is the mud pit. While it might not be center court at Wimbledon or the 12th hole at Augusta, the mud pit, like any other hallowed ground of sport, must be nurtured and maintained with the utmost care. Now, mud is not just mud when it comes to racing, and the man responsible for getting the quagmire to its appropriate gooey texture is the mud maintenance man, or more commonly referred to as the mud puppy. Dana Watson is the mud puppy at Coweta Raceway, just south of Atlanta. Here he is testing the playing field's consistency. Once his batch is ready for racing, it of course needs to be kept up during the event. Well, after the first two classes, the ruts get real deep out here, and the other trucks are faster. So what we have to do is get the pole and pull it through the hole and get some angle on it and push the mud back into the ruts where it would be a lot safer for the other trucks to run on. The best thing to do is just try to get it as smooth as you can where the trucks won't be hitting ruts and stuff to turn over and stuff like that. A mud puppy must be a man with mud in his blood because during the event he spends more time there than any of the racers. Here's a shake, battle and roll salute to one of the true unsung heroes in all of racing the Mud Puppy. Next, we're going to track some of that mud inside the eighth wonder of the world. Since you can't very well dig a hole in the floor of the Houston Astrodome, the mud pit becomes a mound of mud. But this soupy quagmire still offers the same slimy resistance when it comes to bogging down most vehicles, especially those on three wheels. but add a fourth wheel, and sometimes you might be able to save face. Once the tricycles are put away, the big boys like to come out and play, with the action indoors still providing the same slimy thrill.
In tractor pulling, the man providing the challenge is Ron Hickson. Night in and night out, he's every puller's stiffest competition. Hickson commands a contraption called a sled, or more aptly named, the decision maker. As sled operator, he determines how much weight will be used to make each class of pulling competitive. In the event of a pull-off, Hickson has the say when it comes to how much extra weight is needed to break the tie. The sled by itself weighs some 25 to 30,000 pounds. Here's how it works. As the weight box comes forward on the main drive assembly, more pressure is put on the skid pan, creating resistance to eventually stop the vehicle. In the four-wheel drive class, some 15,000 pounds of lead are loaded in the weight box, around 20,000 pounds for the two-wheel drives, and 25,000 pounds for the most powerful class in pulling, the 7,200-pound multiple engine tractors. No vehicle shakes, battles, and rolls with more thunder than these engineering marvels. Every puller's got his own idea of the perfect tractor, and variation is the name of the game when it comes to engine configurations. Engines come in all shapes and sizes. A single 600 cubic inch Arius aluminum racing engine delivering over 1,500 horsepower can cost anywhere from $27 to $30,000 a piece. Some tractors will run three of these generating as much horsepower as possible, while others will compete with four less expensive cast iron Chevy big blocks and get comparable power. But the total combined engine displacement may not exceed 2,100 cubic inches. How all these engines are tied together is a very complex matter. Some are actually bolted crank to crank. Others may act as independent power sources. The drive shafts harness the power from the various engine combinations to a gearbox, which centers all the power to the back tires. A multiple engine tractor can run anywhere from 90 to well over $100,000. But this is not a sport where the most expensive vehicles always dominate. Just as in any form of automotive competition, driving skill and mastering the track conditions come largely into play. And here now is a look at some of those who are best at handling the reins of these muscle machines. 12-time national champion out of Princeton, Indiana, Tim Engler in his Chevy-powered Mission Impossible. Legendary Dave Banner from La Fontaine, Indiana. Mike Piper, a grain farmer from Mount Vernon, Illinois, in the area's powered Just Add Dirt. Dave Walsh from Boston, Wisconsin in the area's powered Irish Challenger. Paul Norman from Charlotte, North Carolina in the area's powered War Wagon. Freeman, Wadesville, Indiana, in the Mean Mistreater. Pat Friels, Island, Kentucky, in the Chevy-powered Dollar Devil. John Carlton out of Little Plymouth, Virginia in the Virginia Farmer. John Heilman in the Levi Garrett machine.
Jim Brockman in the Arias Powered In-Laws and Outlaws. One of the trucks that shakes, battles, and rolls with the best of them is a Chevy from Minnesota, USA One. Truly a crowd favorite, USA One was the number one monster truck in the world, capturing the 1988 championship. This Silverado pickup with 572 cubic inches of Chevy might under the hood hammers out up to 1,600 horsepower. And driver Steve Wilkie knows only one way to drive it. Full tilt. Wilkie attacks the hills and holds on for dear life coming off the cars, hitting the gas when USA 1 appears to be going nose over to drive out of it. While fans may not want to copy Wilkie's driving style, they can model their own truck after USA 1. As a true measure of the big white Chevy's popularity, most Chevy dealerships offer a USA 1 custom kit package to fans who want to turn their own pickups into USA 1 lookalikes. Who knows? You might even see some people emulating Steve Wilkie's free race routine at a stoplight. Here's a look at the real thing in action when the light turns green. Another one of our shake, battle, and roll unsung heroes is the track builder. Now, it may not be as difficult as designing a golf course, but constructing a monster track does have its own tricks. First, you must select the proper types of cars to be crushed. Not just any maker model will do. Generally speaking, foreign cars are just not long enough for monster truck tires. What you need are good old full-size American models. Pick up these heaps from a local junkyard for about $100 a piece. Remove the glass, take out the batteries and gas tanks, and add some hay bales and old tires to these one-time family sedans, and you're ready for racing. fantasize what it'd be like to actually sit in the cab of a monster truck and pretty much drive over anything in your way? Most of us may never get the chance to climb in the saddle of one of these behemoths, or any other racing machine for that matter. But for every man who owns a four-wheel drive truck, there is a place for you in the competitive world of motorsports. The street stock class of mud bog racing. It may not be the same as crushing cars, but it's a lot more affordable. You and your street legal truck get a chance to blast the mud pit just like those nitrous oxide burning machines in the open classes. The biggest requirement in this class is that the vehicle must be factory produced, tagged, and registered. Aside from aluminum manifolds and headers, there's not much else you can do to the engine. And tire height may not exceed 44 inches. The street stock class has taken the off-road craze and transformed it into a form of competition. For most of the racers, this is their idea of a Sunday drive.
street stock class is sometimes viewed as the undercard at a mud bog. Well, if that's the case, then as we've just seen, waiting for the main event can be a lot of fun. The same can be said for a monster truck race or tractor pull, judging from the activity going on between rounds and classes. At the Houston Astrodome, their annual monster truck and tractor pull show begins with the parade of trucks, a salute to the iron horse of the working man. Well, at a mud bog, they had their own traditional way of closing a show. And those not owning a mud racer get their own shot at racing through the quagmire. <laughs> One of the more entertaining classes in pulling is the 5,800-pound modified tractors. Unlike their bigger siblings, the 7,200-pound tractor, which runs three or four engines, these machines run only two. But that doesn't limit the variety of setups you'll see in this class. Generally speaking, the same types of engines that the 72s run are found here. Supercharged, alcohol-burning, big-block Chevys, and aluminum-block Arius V8s with no cubic inch limitations. Each engine generates around 1,500 horsepower. Some are mounted crank to crank, some independently. The frames are smaller, so the driver appears to sit a little higher in the saddle. Maybe that's one of the reasons these machines seem to have a little more personality. As we see here on Eddie Govro's Blue Ox, two engines just don't leave much room for a hood ornament. But try finding a blower like this in your hometown. Those machines, less ornate, have names that more than make up for it. You can speculate all you want about where some of those nicknames come from, but there's one vehicle whose name says it all, Robert Soisson's flying machine. All you have to do is listen to the engines and you'll know what we mean. That's the sound of two T-53 like homing helicopter engines. These stock turbines are harnessed to a gearbox, which then transfers the power to the drive shafts, which power the rear end. But the flying machine isn't the only crowd pleaser in this class. Here's a look at some of the other stars who shake, battle, and roll in the 5,800-pound modified tractor class. Ron Headley from Fairfield, Ohio in Betty's Headache. Rittinger out of Circleville, Ohio in Outcast 2. Jerry Forenage, Kyoto, Iowa, he drives Lurch.
Jan Sneezing, and the Bionic Buzzard, Sydney, Ohio. Bob Chickering in the Inch Pincher 3, Bloomfield, Iowa. Wayne Sullivan, Warsaw, Kentucky, in the Kentuckian. Ken Popham in the Outlaw from Floresville, Texas. One of the more daring designs in the monster truck circuit comes to us from the Show Me State of Missouri. Part of the collection known as the Breen Boys Racing Toys. Mad Dog is a truck built for a man who likes to feel the wind in his face. It's the closest thing you'll find to a convertible monster truck. All that keeps driver Bob Breen from racing in an open cockpit is a full steel roll cage complete with a little wing on top. It's more for a show than anything else. The driver sets in the middle, giving the Chevy Blazer a slight resemblance to a mud racer. While the Mad Dog offers some unique body features that are popular with the fans, this truck still has the same type of suspension you'd find on most heavy vehicles. Their leaf spring setup can put them at a disadvantage against the more state-of-the-art monster trucks with racing suspensions. But that's just what these good old country boys from Jefferson City, Missouri would like to have you believe. The Breen Boys' battle cry is make it or break it. And that caution to the win approach has put many a competitor on the trailer. In monster truck racing, Chevys predominate. And two of the heartbeat of America's finest are the Carolina Crusher and Nightlife. Gary Porter's Carolina Crusher is one of the most consistent runners in the monster truck circuit. Consistent because this sturdy, long wheelbase Chevy weighing well over 12,000 pounds rarely breaks. Porter was the runner-up to the national champion equalizer in 1989 due in large part to his strong showing in the summer outdoor series. And the Carolina native will be the first to admit he prefers racing out in the fresh air to indoor arenas. I like running outdoors better because there's room for a mistake, and if a truck has an advantage over you, have room to run down and catch them. We're in here, one mistake, you're a history, and there's no room to run them down and catch them you know, at the finish line. It's all over, more or less, at the starting line. But even indoors, no one seems to compare when it comes to getting air. 468 cubic inches of Chevy power is sent skyward by the dirt ramps that serve as a launching pad for the Carolina Crusher. Now, most monster trucks have automatic transmission. The Carolina Crusher runs a Turbo 400, the same kind you can buy in a Chevy truck. But after several modifications, Gary Porter ends up with what he calls a manual automatic that he has to shift during a race. We call it having your hands full with over six tons of racing power.
other guy with his hands full is Dave Wyzorek out of Grand Island, Nebraska, the driver, owner, and builder of Nightlife. Wyzorek used to exhibit a unique driving style where he'd hang his head out the window of the blowing and inspect a Chevy Stepside while lining up for the first set of cars. Things have gotten easier since he's gone to a new truck. Well, I used to drive in Nightlife too with my head out the window because I'd fix myself at a focus point at the end and head for it, but now with, with this new truck, I can't lean out because of the seat. I'll break some ribs if I do, so I'm just trying to get the hang of it. This marks the third monster truck why Zorik has built from the ground up, including the paint job. In fact, that's how the Chevy got its name, because for two months, all why Zorik did at night was work on his truck. His latest truck is some 1,500 pounds lighter with better racing suspension, but new or old, step side or sports side, the nightlife remains one of the hardest chargers on the circuit. One of the most popular classes in pulling is the modified four-wheel drives. Many fans are truck owners themselves, and the 4x4s closely resemble the pickups parked in their driveways. Back when this class first got started, many of the pullers brought their own four-wheel drives from home to compete. Now underneath those factory-looking bodies are big block racing engines and custom frames and chassis made from aircraft aluminum. The engines are limited to 750 cubic inches and must be naturally aspirated. Weight distribution is not as critical here as in the other pulling classes, but strong chassis and drive frames are a must. The idea is to get as much weight to all four tires as possible. Very little is needed in the back because the sled weighing some 50,000 pounds holds the rear end down. But up front, engines are moved as far forward as possible within the rule and massive amounts of weights are hung off the end. Compared to other classes in pulling, the 4x4s are relatively inexpensive to build and maintain. Competition is no less fierce. It can best be described as battle of the brand. Now, truck owners can be a fiercely loyal group, and in this class, they get a chance to cheer for their favorite make and model. Ford, Chevy, Dodge, GMC. Shake, battle, and roll takes a look at some of those who best represent these great truck manufacturers. Tommy Holman out of Wayne, Ohio in the Dodge Saturday Night Driller. Manuel Moreno, Seguin, Texas, GMC, Yellow Rose of Texas. Miramar, Florida's Glenn Davis, Mr. Sparkle, Chevrolet. <laughs> Tony Osteen, West Green, Georgia, in the Ford Georgia Rebel. Sanders Chevy, the Tennessean, out of Nashville. Jim Lyons, Louisville, Kentucky, 
Stitches, 10 Can, GMC. Howard Lewis in his Chevy High Roller. Dave Willoughby from Athens, Ohio in his 1940 Ford pickup. Robert Gallahan in the 1990 Ford out of Manassas, Virginia. Robert Smith and the Three Bears pulling team. Notice the passenger he likes to take along with him in that blue Chevy. Many drivers like USA One Steve Wilkie first started out as mechanics before piloting these vehicles. Others like Carolina Crusher's Gary Porter, the Gravedigger's Dennis Anderson, and Dave Wyzorek of Nightlife build and maintain their own trucks. These men know better than anyone the enormous amount of work and money it takes to build and keep these machines running. To start with, months, even years, go into constructing one of these racing giants. Price tags range anywhere from eighty to two hundred thousand dollars. Even though it takes only about five seconds to run your average indoor monster truck race, the amount of stress put on the driver and truck is incredible. Monster truck racing is sometimes described as a planned accident. Well over a thousand horsepower spinning huge tires into a bunch of rusty iron is no one's idea of a Sunday drive. When a monster truck actually lands on the junk cars, what it amounts to is a head-on collision at 30 miles an hour. Drivers suit up with every type of safety gear possible, but they're still tossed around like rag dolls. The only thing taking more of a beating is the truck, where an average weekend of racing can cost well over $5,000 in repairs alone. In tractor pulling, the chauffeur doesn't take anywhere near the beating, but the heat a single or a group of engines can build up during a pull is so great Many tractors can make no more than two runs a night before running the risk of frying a $20,000 motor. As we mentioned earlier, driving a mud razor is like being shot out of a cannon. The tremendous horsepower launching these machines will actually flex the chassis. As they say, that's racing. And sometimes you're left shaking when the battle costs you a roll of cash. It's action like this that sends drivers and crews scrambling to patch up these road warriors. These men are pushed to the limit in between rounds or working through the night to get things fixed for the next day's show. 
When it comes to tractor pulling, monster truck, and mud racing, the drivers aren't the only ones who shake, battle, and roll. It comes out of the valve. I'm at my trailer and grab me another cylinder. I got a spare Where's cylinder. It? While the level of competition is high, so too is the degree of sportsmanship. Drivers helping drivers to keep these vehicles running is a long-standing practice in these relatively new sports. And that family spirit of pitching in is taken even a step further on one pulling team, where a crew member is not only a part of the family, but the puller's wife. As crew chief for Mike Piper's Just Add Dirt, White Barb not only offers him technical advice, but some moral support as well. In many ways, that's what these sports are all about, an activity the whole family can enjoy. The competition may not always be clean, but most of the time it's good, exciting fun, even if it is a little on the loud side. Trucks and tractor fans are both young and old. You never know who's dragging who to the show. The parent, who's the proud owner of a truck, or the kid who wears his favorite monster truck t-shirt. Whatever the case may be, both young and old love to get up and go when it comes time to shake, battle, and roll in their hometown.